so many of the same, you know, of course, attractions to the complexity of this script and the seeming <laughs> sense of it being simple because you're seeing the surfaces and and then the depths keep emerging as you go. And then and then there was this second character. And talking to Natalie Portman made me think about Julianne Moore and someone I've known my whole career. And here was Gracie Atherton, you, this unbelievably complicated, destabilizing character. And to have these two female central characters at the core of a film is such a gift. And particularly someone who's made female subjects such a, you know, something I've returned to in my films. This was an amazing opportunity that I, of course, leapt at. And we should also note that this is Sammy Birch's first produced script, which is remarkable. Um, yes, definitely um, And Julianne, I want to bring you in next. Gracie, as we were just talking about, she's such a complicated woman. There is there is a big gap between what she believes her life is, between the life that she thinks created and what the reality is. And a lot of the trouble is in that wide gap that's happening. And when that gap started to approach him is when we see your performance shift tone. So maybe tell us a little bit about getting into Gracie's headspace and tapping into those complicated emotions in your performance. Yeah, happily. I mean, that's that's exactly right what you said. I mean, she's she is, she has created a, a narrative for herself about what her, what her life is, what it has become, um, and it's and it's quite different than than the reality. And I think she has to sustain that narrative. Um, uh, otherwise, there would, it would be complete destruction to her, you know. And there were things in the script, and then when I was when I was working on this because it was really complicated that I didn't understand. I didn't. I I, I was I, I'm like I don't understand that how commanding she is. I don't, I can't really figure out how she seems to be in control. And it wasn't until I started exploring this, this, um, this narrative of her being rescued by this prince. You know, she really believes that she was rescued from her life by this prince, um, this, this man who was 13 years old. So to make this 13 year old viable, she has to elevate him to, you know, adult, an adult. And she stays kind of forever a child, a princess. So there's that. So that's, that narrative is out there, and that's the one she so desperately wants Elizabeth to see and understand. And then there's the reality. And Sammy very beautifully constructed these private moments where you see when she is alone that there's this tremendous emotional volatility. And he said remorse, too. That's the first time anybody's ever said that. And I, I think that that's definitely present. I think that idea of, of, um, of, of shame, even, you know, um, and then what, you know, what does it? What is it that drives someone to 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 tell that story? You know, why do they feel that they have no agency or autonomy in the world unless they're rescued by a man? They find a man and a, and a child. You know, it's something. It's something really compelling and complicated and very much about culture and gender and identity. And Charles, your character is is so fascinating, and you know, through the way you play him. And at first, I want to say. He just won a Gotham Award for Best Supporting Actor. And a New York Critics Circle Award for Best Supporting Actor. Woo! The, yes. the first two of many, I have no doubt. So let's get back to the question. He's a really fascinating character because he sort of, you know, at least to me in the movie, starts on the sidelines and starts surfacing. and kind of becomes this emotional core, and that's when the film's tonality, I think, shifts from humor to tragedy, when you are more on the forefront. So maybe tell us a little bit about your process of trying to understand Joe and how he came to be. Yeah, it really just started with Sammy's script, and there's just so much in between the text for all the characters, and there's so much subtlety that I found with Joe, and just really looking at the facts, you know, he, he had this immense sense of responsibility at the age of 13. He was a father. And just kind of trying to dive into what the psychology of that would look like and really feel like. And having three kids, uh, being 36, getting ready for his kids to graduate high school, being an empty nester, uh, the arrival of Elizabeth, 
all these different things that are happening in this two week span kind of really, we see this um, arrested development, this innocence of Joe, this tragedy slowly rise to the surface where he's really maybe asking himself these questions he's never really asked before. And just kind of understanding the whole, uh, you know, Joe I think says he doesn't want to really take up so much space. He's kind of protecting himself, right? He doesn't really, words don't flow easily for Joe. And just understanding this, um, how he had to, uh, in a way, create this adaptive adult child in order to survive beyond you know, his responsibility and just public perception of all these things that were being said about him and just really trusting in Todd the whole way through and then having Natalie and Julie just lifting me up every step of the way. We had so much fun. I just learned so much just by being with them and that just allowed me to really just let go when we worked. And also you, you mentioned that you were considering what this character would not only feel like but look like and on that note you bring a certain physicality to this role. You know, certain moments I'm convinced that you're this, you know, older man and then the next scene you look like a child and you wear them both so organically. So maybe tell us a little bit about tapping into that really, you know, two different physicalities, the dichotomy of it. Yeah, I think it's like this contusion of all this repression that Joe has inside of him and kind of like what maybe I, I think I've read somewhere where you know emotions and traumas like stay in the body there's things we maybe don't process mentally that just kind of exist in our body so just understanding that and just kind of he just doesn't really want to take up space you know he doesn't really want to be seen and he doesn't even know what to see and that's why with Elizabeth coming, Natalie's character coming in, he's, she's asking him questions that he's never really been asked before. And that's when we see Joe looking into the camera, into the mirror for the first time. I think, for me, that's the first time Joe ever looks at himself, ever. And I think, you know, you can say so much in just saying nothing at all. So being able to exist in the body, I thought, was kind of like a safe space for me. And Todd, I mentioned this a couple of times, the tonal shifts in the movie. There is great sense of humor in it, I, I, and I think it's, it's okay to laugh, but it's an uncomfortable sort of laugh, and then it turns into tragedy. I'm wondering um, how much of that was the scripts doing, and how did you kind of plot it visually um, in your movie, that, those tonal shifts? It was all there <clears throat> in the script. It's just that it, the script was almost like in a pinter script where the what is said is the top most most conscious manifestation of what has been buried and what's possible to say and it suggests in its sort of in the spaces between words in what in the in the inability for characters to really see themselves um, everything resides and everything gets exposed in what, at one point or another and so but the style wasn't really implicit on the page and I felt like what the film needed was both a sense of distance from that a sense of observational a camera that was observant that would hold that would allow it almost trap these characters in the frame cage them in the frame combined with something very strong and that was manifest more in the score and the use of music so that you felt that kind of that kind of conflict in the in the tonal elements of the film itself that gave you permission, if not the necessity, to be thinking and questioning with yourself as you watch the story unfold. I felt like the, the script provoked that kind of interpretive st stance in the reader, and that's what I wanted to try to provide for the viewer of the film, but have it be a kind of delicious, um, subversive uh, pleasure that would, and, and that's not something you necessarily think audiences today are up for, to not know exactly where this is going and what to think of the characters. And that's been such a, um, you know, it's because of these performances 
and it's because of the entire company of people and the whole spirit in which this film was made. Somehow, something very finite is presented to viewers and audiences feel secure enough to not know what to think and to feel excited about that process. It's one of the most exciting things about this movie, that, that moral gray area that we're dwelling in and we're not sure whether we're supposed to laugh or cry or maybe a little bit of both. So, Juliet and Natalie, I want to ask you next. We were talking about performance, and I, I don't even know how to articulate all the layers of performance in it, Natalie. You're an actor playing an actor. <laughs> then, then your actor character is trying to learn from someone who's also acting because there's a performative streak to Gracie. All these Russian dolls of layers and layers of acting, and you build it so wonderfully together. At one point, we're not sure when, where one ends, the other one begins. So tell us about your joint process of finding those characters and then with you becoming both Elizabeth and Gracie in the process. <laughs> um, <laughs> a crazy question. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, it was such a rich construction that Sammy gave us. Um, of, as you said, the actors playing the actors playing the actors playing the <laughs> actors, um, because the character of Gracie is so performative in her conviction about the story of her life. And then, of course, Julie is playing her. Julie has talked about how she, she did research on how to bake a cake and <laughs> how to arrange flowers. And then I watched her baking a cake and arranging flowers and trying to do it. And there was just this constant um, kind of cycle of, of performance that felt so emblematic of, of what we do as humans, but particularly what we do as females, how much performance goes into our daily life of, you know, look at how I present feminine physically look at how I can be a mother and a partner and a friend and when you say something rude to me I'm not gonna lash out at you I'm gonna take it in like there's such a feminized demand to perform that you know some of us rebel against but some of us swallow whole and um, and an actress of course kind of epitomizes that because she's literally performing and um, so it was it was a dream to get to do it with Julie and to get to be inspired by and literally get to copy her because it's what I want to do all the time anyway. Um, so it was great that that was part of the, the job uh, job description. There was something, I mean, I, I can't say enough about Natalie. I had such a wonderful time working with her and we were really truly um, a team and you don't know what to expect when you go into a job, whether or not you're going to mesh with another another performer and we had to work we were working so closely and so so quickly and you know Todd and I talked a lot about who Gracie was going to be and how I needed to come up with some characteristics for Natalie to copy and so so there were things that I was looking for that were performative as a character for Gracie that would mean something to me and um, and that I could physicalize and so basically it came you know, that narrative, that sort of princess narrative, that very kind of, that sort of hyper-feminine behavior um, was something that I wanted to use, and, and the childishness. So I, you know, talked to Todd about maybe having a vocal thing, having a lisp, because that was something very, um, you know, very concrete that I could give to Natalie, as well as these gestures. But then as soon as we, the wonderful things, as soon as we started working, we were working pretty much chronologically, um, Natalie started doing these wonderful things where she was able, as she was copying me, to kind of corroborate me as Gracie. So that, you know, we're in a scene and I'm sitting there like this and I see Natalie doing the same thing, but she does it in a way that makes me feel validated, that makes Gracie feel great. So I'm having a wonderful time as an actor with Natalie Portman and going like, she's awesome, this is so much fun. At the same time that she's making me feel great as my character. So that was something that kind of continued through our whole process together and was really wonderful. And then would also you know, morph in places where the characters are more and more antagonistic and they're in kind of a struggle for dominance. But never, ever, ever did I ever doubt that Natalie wasn't my complete partner and it sort of allowed us to 
go further into it. I mean, it became very intimate and fun and playful. And I think we both did things that we wouldn't have expected ourselves to do to each other. Yes. And it was awesome. <laughs> it, was, it was so, so fun. And I felt so safe with Julie. And she's so loving and warm and generous, as you can tell, with, you know, thinking about my performance while she was, you know, constructing her own so that I had something to, to latch on to. And it was, it was so safe that it was like so delicious to just see her be a fucking like fearless, try anything, rock and roll, like just, you know, to come in with that lisp is like my dream as an actress of just seeing someone do something so extreme, but you totally know they're a real person immediately. It's like the coolest thing you, and like most, like highest difficulty thing you can do as an actor to make choices that bold that are also so human and touching. And I was, yeah, it was, it was just so fun to get to play. And Todd just created this incredibly safe space where we could just push each other and play and try wild things and explore. And I understand that you did all this and all tried all these wild things in 23 days or something. It's a really sh short shoot, which is unbelievable. Um, and Todd, I want to ask you next, and I think this really connects to what we were talking about, about performance, the way you capture some of these, you know, where one ends, the other begins through reflections and mirrors. And there's this shopping scene, and there's a scene where you're putting makeup on Natalie. I mean, one's mind goes to persona um, and, and, and things like that. So I guess maybe tell us a little bit about constructing that visually, what your references were, what your intentions were. Yes, uh, Persona was an immediate first uh, place after reading the script where these about these two women who were merging and playing games of power with each other. And Persona has only one scene, I think, where they where the direct address, where the the eyes really pass into the lens of the camera. It was another Bergman film called Winter Light that I thought about when I first read the script and read that unbelievable monologue that Natalie delivers at the end of the film. And remember, and remember this scene from Winter Light where Ingrid Thulin delivers a letter to the lens of the camera in a medium symmetrical shot. It's the only time that happens in that film. And I remember seeing it when I was a teenager and being utterly riveted by how that was portrayed, but ultimately how that was performed. So this idea, so I, I thought, I have to do this movie if only to shoot that final scene with Natalie <laughs> in that direct address. Now that direct address is sort of in a cosmic mirror. She's, 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 she's in the sort of apotheosis of her transformation toward Gracie. And it's almost like this masturbatory scene where she's basically like in the peak of pleasure and really in an authentic place as an actor in fully embodying somebody else. Now all the mirror scenes that lead up to that in the film are these two women in a sort of game of appearances and of looks. Now, from just a technical standpoint, there is no mirror. There's the lens of a camera that these two actors are letting us know exactly what's happening by looking directly into the lens of the camera for their own reflection, and then at a mark off the edge of the lens as the reflection of the other woman. And this relay of looks is exposing this dynamic of these two ultimately unassailable women in a duel of power that keeps playing out toward the final scene of the movie and the, after the graduation scene and that face off. So not only did I have these two women at the core of my film to make these kinds of shots work. But then I had this guy. <laughs> this work I had never seen before, who delivered this coherent idea of who Joe was in his audition, in his self-tape, that made me understand this story before I was ready to understand this story, particularly the backstory. I just saw the whole history of Joe in what Charles was doing intuitively 
and consciously as an actor with his body, with his timing. I mean, the emotional core of the film is sort of earned by Joe in the film, but Charles also has this unbelievable comic timing. And this, like, he has all the technical skills and all the intuition of the finest actor. And so the film rests on that performance to a degree that was even a surprise to all of us as we, as we were making it. I have so many follow-up questions, but first I want to ask. <laughs> first, I would love for Natalie to chime in about that amazing monologue scene, because I was going to ask about that. What was it like filming that for you? You're finally within the performance, within performance. So tell us a little bit about shooting that from your perspective. Well, it was incredibly written to begin with. Sammy's writing, especially in contrast to the final scene of the film, which is the literal performance, which is kind of schlocky, you know, like <laughs> intentionally. Um, and, um, you know, to just have this very true letter from the exact time of their affair and then you know, contrast it to the, the performative version of it. And then Todd just created this incredible framing concept and the mirror concept where, which is so much what this is about, is reflection when you are seen, how it affects the way you behave and how it affects your identity when, you know, when Gracie is observed by Elizabeth how it changes the course of her life, how looking in the mirror affects who we are, and the mirror as audience, you know, literally when the camera is the mirror. And so it was just a remarkable setup and concept to address and to question, and, and also because of the simplicity of it, allowed us to do many takes and try many things, and we were just like, kids playing, we were like, what if we do one that's like this, or what if we try this? And we really got to explore, which is so rare when you shoot something in 23 days. And then also when it's followed up by the incredible performance Charles gives in the mirror, when he looks in the mirror, and finally after all of this artifice, and all of this game playing, you have someone with a true, honest heart, and you see into his heart, it just like, you're so hungry for it because there's just been so much lying. And you're like, someone tell me something true. Someone show me something true, and he does. There's an incredible scene between Charles, you, and Grace's character in the bedroom when you're finally ready to confront, and you say, if we love each other as much as we say we do, why can't we talk about this? And the second time I saw the movie, I completely lost it and started sobbing for the rest of it. It was just, you give such an incredible performance. So I want to ask both you and Julianne to talk about that scene a little bit, finding that emotional truth that's just really explodes, that's been under a pressure cooker until then. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, I remember that day well. Um, you know, I remember blocking that scene and you can hear a needle drop on the carpet. It was just so sacred every day, but I remember that scene because it's the first time Joe is finally asking the question. I think we as the audience are like asking, Joe, why, you know, ask the question, like, come on. And um, yeah, I, you know, I, it, all of these things are rising to the surface in that scene for Joe. All, he's breaking out of that shell, and he's not even pointing his finger or blaming. He's just asking. And that's why I think it's so heartbreaking. And whew, ah, Julie, that day, that was, it was so, there's just so much in that scene, and uh, just taunt. I mean, I, I really don't have any other to say other than Julia and Todd on that day and just like trusting them and just being able to yeah I mean it was it was what was so beautiful about it too is that you know it's so emblematic of what their relationship has been um, that you know Gracie is someone who's who's 
basically continually gaslighting everybody, you know, I mean, she's saying, this is the truth, this is what happened. And when he says, you know, maybe I was too young, she says, you seduced me. I mean, that's the kind of the baldest statement she makes. And in that moment, she's saying, you know, it's like, I mean, it's really great. I mean, it's really incredible that she does it. It's sort of, it's terrifying. And when you have someone, you know, we were talking about behavior and, and what's truly scary. And, you know, I think we all know that, that in life, what's really scary are people who cross boundaries and, and serious boundaries. And so you, you can even be in a, you can be in any kind of situation if somebody has done something and behaviorally that's dangerous, everyone feels weird. You're just like, because it could happen again. You don't know how it's going to happen. We all have these boundaries that we respect. And so here is this woman. You're seeing very, very clearly that she's not going to give up on this, that she's going to maintain this narrative at all costs. And even when she feels like she can't, when she's losing it, she's like, she gets up and, and throw the, the line that's sort of wonderful is that, you know, it's graduation. Right? Which is, you know, yeah, comical, and but also emblematic of all of that construction. You know, there's home, and there's family, and there are princes and princesses, and there's home-cooked food, and there's high school, and there's graduation, and there's cheerleading, and there's this. So it's all of that archetypal, um, you know, American behavior, all that stuff that she has to believe in and hold on to. Um, and so that was what was so fascinating about playing that. Is, you know, what, like I said, that idea of like, what, what, you know, what is that to, to, to gaslight for so long and so hard? Um, I think, thank you so much. That's such a generous answer. Yes. Um, I, I think we're going to have to wrap up, but I want to ask one last question and switch the darker note to a lighter one, taking a cue from the film's tonal shift. So I don't know if you know this, but right now the internet is losing its head over, I don't know if we have enough hot dogs. I don't think if we have enough hot dogs. <laughs> Everybody loves that line. It's, it's everywhere, everybody's coding, it's become a meme. And I mean, in, in the script, I don't know how it was, whether there was a comedy factor, but Julianne, your line delivery finds that, and Todd, you enter this music, which you know was repurposed. So, Tell us a little bit about delivering that line and what the thinking was to uh, insert comedy right there. Yeah. Yeah, we knew it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> we, we did and we didn't. Because, because what I love about it is how it's described in the script is like something incredibly horrible is, is happening to Gracie. When she opens the refrigerator door, she looks like something severe is happening, and then says that line. <laughs> and and it's an insight into the instability of this woman. You start to gather these clues, but it was an opportunity, of course, to start to let the audience go. Wait, 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 and recalibrate our reactions to it with the music and with the zoom. <clears throat> I remember I saw the movie in Cannes, and after that line, everybody was like, it's on. <laughs> That's what happened. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.